You're listening to episode 170 of the Writing Life podcast from the National Centre for Writing, a weekly podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Simon Jones and it is the 28th of October 2021 here in Norwich. It's a very exciting week because we have a new pack of early career writer resources. As with the other packs, this one is completely free and packed full of useful information. And the theme this time round is editing. In this pack, which you can download from the National Centre for Writing website, we have Ella Michaela on the podcast today. Ella is an editor and translator and co-founder of Kuramuru Books, who specialise in translated books for children, middle grade and YA readers. We also have a brilliant video interview with Hannah Chukwu, who is assistant editor at Penguin Random House. Mary Paulson Ellis has written a piece for us on the editing process. And I've also put together a video all about the basics of self-editing. If this is the first time you've heard of our Early Career Writers Resource Packs, then do check out the rest of them on the website. I'm going to put links down in the show notes for this episode. We've done packs on how to get started, method, character, plot, world building, dialogue, structure. We come out with these every few months and it's all completely free. And we've had incredible insight and advice from writers including Ema McBride, Jenny Offal, Sarah Perry, Michael Donkor, Nicola Upson, Inua Ellums, Kieran Gillen, Abby Dare, Chris Beckett, Hannah Berry, Rebecca Watson and Rob Shearman, and that's just a selection of them. These really are incredible resources for writers at any stage of your career, but particularly if you're starting out and needing to know what to do next. Okay, so let's head straight in to my conversation with Ella, all about editing and translating. Hi Ella, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Excellent. Thanks for coming on. So I think we met when you did a workshop for the National Centre for Writing back in March. Yes. Which feels like ages ago. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, that was so full of brilliant advice for writers in terms of how to work with an editor and how the editing process works that I I knew we had to get you on the podcast to, to share some of that insight as well. So just to give people a little bit of background on what you do. So you're an editor and a translator. Yes, that's right. Um, I started off as a translator. I kind of fell into it just by virtue of um, being bilingual. Um, and then I began editing when after I studied creative writing at the University of East Anglia. Um, I think like a lot of people who study creative writing, I obviously was setting out to be a writer. Um, But it was in workshops with other students that I realized editing is where I feel really comfortable and really, really um, proud of the work that I do. And it's just very satisfying. Um, So I'm lucky to call that my job now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So editing wasn't necessarily what you were thinking of when you first started studying creative writing. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, initially, I was going to go down the academic right and route and do a PhD in creative writing. Um, but then the longer I stayed in academia, the more I had this desire to do something practical. Um, and that's what led me into publishing. And um, working in publishing meant that as well as writing every day and editing, I could also do hands-on things all around book production because at the end of the day um, I got into translation and editing because I love books Um, so now as an editor I get to have a hand in every single aspect of making one. Do you think it's the process that you enjoy and you know kind of that the more nuts and bolts aspects of creating a book? Yes yeah I think that's it sometimes I when I'm working on a manuscript and it seems never ending, the edit the editing process goes around and around and around. I sometimes think, oh, I wish I were something like a carpenter, where <laughs> you know, in a couple of days you can shape something with your hands. Whereas with the with the book production process, everything is so long and drawn out. Um, And as an author, you only really see one side of it. It may feel like forever writing your manuscript, putting your baby out into the world. Um, But as an editor, you see the process from beginning to end. And it could take anywhere from six months to three years before you finally get that final final book in your hands. And it's a very rewarding um, but also frustrating process. Um, So 
it's it's been a joy to work on every single aspect of it as an editor. Yeah, and even from the reader perspective, you're only really ever made aware of the writer. Yes. You, know, you get a book and it's written by somebody and you're like, yeah. oh, they did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't, you know, the book doesn't always make it obvious. There's, there's not like a list of credits in the way you get at the end of a movie, for example. You know, no, you don't yeah. always get the sense of all the people that were involved yeah. to actually bring the writer's vision into the form of the finished book. Yeah. Although in recent years, um, I've noticed that acknowledgement sections in popular fiction books tend to get longer and longer. And I always make sure to read every single name in the mm. acknowledgement section. And I just imagine, you know, all the all the stress and and um, joy as well that people went through to produce this book that I'm reading right now. I always suggest to people who who are looking for editors or other people to work with, you know, pick up your favorite book and look in the acknowledgement section and just Google the names that you find because those people are out there and they're always happy to take on new projects. Um, for you, how would you kind of define the role of an editor? Oh, that's a tough one. I think when I first started, I just thought it was marking up pages with a red pen. And I still do that. I know a lot of people think that red pens are scary, but I think they're <laughs> the easiest thing to use. Um, but the longer I've been doing this, the more your role expands. And in in the past week alone, as well as doing structural edits on one book, I've been doing proofreading on another book. Um, and those are very separate processes in themselves. Um, but I've also kind of been acting as psychologist and counselor to the authors I've been working with, you know, talking them down when they have, um, you know, not nervous breakdowns exactly, but when when they're feeling stressed and anxious about their book and their creative process, um, it's it's a role of the editor to kind of support them through it. I think my favorite way of putting it is that I'm I'm a midwife. Of, of books. And it's sometimes a very difficult birthing process. Um, but it's it's an absolute privilege to be beside the author when they're bringing a new book into the world. Yeah, that sensitivity is so important because, you know, writers probably been alone with, with that text and the idea for years. Yes. And now all of a sudden is having to interact with other people who are, you know, poking at it and pulling it apart and, yes. and questioning it. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Sensitivity, that word you used, is is the most important, really, because um, with each author that you work with, you have to adjust to their process. You have to learn to take on their voice in a way, and you have to tease out what they're trying to put onto the page. Um because obviously you're always going to have a different perspective reading their book to what their intention was. And as an editor, it's it's your role to um, to kind of tease out exactly what they wanted the book to be and to bring that across to the reader. So, I mean, middleman isn't the nicest way to put it, but an editor is also that in a way. Um, I don't know if I answered your question very clearly. <laughs> An editor essentially does everything in a way. Yeah, it's interesting because you know, you're saying that even just now you're you're doing all these different kind of types of editing at the moment, mm. and I I was wondering whether you whether you got you know different types of editors, you know, ones who specialised in proofing, ones who specialised in structural edits, or specialise in line edits, and you know all those different types. But it sounds like you kind of cross over the, the whole spectrum. Yes, there are editors who who specialize in different types, and you'll find professional proofreaders who have trained um, within certain house styles who have a very methodical way of doing proofreading, and they tend to work with large publishing houses, and all they do is proofreading. And proofreading, a lot of people confuse that with line editing, for example. They think you're kind of going through and changing everything. But a proofreader will look at a finished typeset manuscript and only check for typos to make sure that all the words have been um, put onto the page in the right way in order for the book to be printed. So it's the very, very last stage. And it's a very difficult job, but it's also not a creative job. Um, all the different kinds of editing that come before then, um, you start off with the very broad kind of developmental editing. 
Um, as an example, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm working with someone who is planning to write their memoir, um, and they're not a professional author. So through interviews, we're kind of developing a structure of what the book will look like, of how to shape all of the different anecdotes from their life into a narrative form that will carry a reader through. And that's the complete opposite end of the scale to proofreading, which comes at the very end. Um, so it's really up to each individual editor. Um, some editors do everything like I do, um, mainly because editors are naturally hustlers these days. <laughs> um, it's difficult to find um you know, regular work in the publishing industry. So naturally, as an editor, you take on roles and opportunities wherever you find them. I think my favorite type of edi editing to do is um, structural and line editing. And that's where you get to the nitty gritty of a book. So you have a rough first draft of a book and you go through it and you check for character arcs, story and plot development. You see where possibly new scenes need to be written by a writer or where characters can be killed off or fleshed out. So really just shaping what's already there and making it the best that it can be. You mentioned the the memoir that you're helping somebody yes. with. Yeah, I was curious because that sounds like that's not been written yet. No, that's right. So it's still in development. That's really interesting because my assumption is always that the editor you know comes in after there is some kind of manuscript. So I'm just curious about how how do you get involved with different projects and you know, how do they appear on your radar? How do you then end up working with these writers who are at presumably very different positions in the, the project's kind of lifetime. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think this is where the role of editor is also quite um, undefined because we do come in at different stages. Um, for example, a commissioning editor at a publishing house could possibly um, decide on a topic for a book and then go out and find someone to write that book for them. Um, so they would be a part of the process from its very inception. Um, in my case, projects tend to kind of just arrive near me. And then I like to go out and meet people who are interested in writing and have a chat with them to see how we can develop things. So it's mainly through my connections here in Norwich that I, I meet people from all walks of life who want to write a book because everybody has a book in them, especially in Norwich, the city of stories. <laughs> yep. I think it was uh, the, the guys at the Book Hive who noted that walking around Norwich and talking to people, it's, um, it's like the literary equivalent of when you walk around LA and there's just e actors are everywhere, whereas in Norwich, yes. it's writers <laughs> are everywhere. <laughs> it, it is it is wonderful. It's it's really nice to, to be in a city where people love books so much and where people are really interested in the nitty gritty production process. Um, but with most kind of amateur writers, I I do kind of talk them through and manage their expectations of what the publishing industry is like and what the different stages of writing are. Um, and a lot of people are surprised that in traditional publishing, you don't even have to have a finished book before you submit to an agent, for example. You mainly need the first three chapters, and then an agent will continue working with you to finish the book. So it really depends on what route you want to go down. If you want to go down um, traditional publishing via an agent and then getting an advance from a publisher, or if you want to take control um, and go down the self-publishing route and do everything yourself, which can be a very rewarding process, even if it's the more difficult way to do things. Yeah, in terms of working with writers who are going down the traditional approach or self-publishing, what kind of a difference does that make to your interactions with the writer? Does it is there any difference particularly? Um, there is a huge difference in that I always aim to connect them to the right kind of agent and the right kind of publisher. And I would also help them form a book proposal. Um, because it's like with any job application, you kind of need to know the structure and formatting um, when submitting to agents in London, for example. And 
as an editor, I usually step in at this point and I help them polish the first three chapters of their novel and then write a proposal that's suited to the particular agent that they're applying to. Um, and it makes a huge difference in in whether you get, you know, ignored at the bottom of the slush pile or if an agent actually stops and thinks, oh, that has some spark that I can work with. Yeah. Um, and in terms of when you start working with writers, obviously, you, were, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, being sensitive is important. And yeah. obviously, in the process, there will almost inevitably probably be difficult conversations that oh, you have yes. to have. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering, like, what what do you do to establish good communications with, with the writers that you're working with? And, and also, is there anything writers can do to aid in that kind of process as well? I think the best way to communicate is, is always either on the phone or face-to-face, -face if possible. Uh, being able to read people's tone of voice and their facial expressions and body language when you're giving them criticisms on their baby, <laughs> um, <laughs> their book that they've worked on for so long. Um, the main thing is that you have to trust each other and the author has to trust that you have their best interests in mind and that you're both on the same page with what the aims for the book are. Um, because obviously they're going to feel a little bit attacked in some ways because you're literally taking apart sentences that they've crafted and suggesting ways of doing it better. Um, so I always start with managing their expectations of how much editing I will do. Um, if only a light amount of editing is necessary, you know, I'll ask them, do they want me to, to really kind of tear everything apart and start anew? Or are they happy with my light approach? Um, in the case of tearing everything apart and starting anew, um, I usually always send an editorial letter. And um, those to me are like love letters to the author and the book. So an editorial letter will outline everything that I love about the book. It'll be from my perspective as a reader. It's, it's about what makes the book work how I felt, um, which characters I loved, what I see um, as the place that the book has in literature at the moment. Um, and that is like a nice page long lead in to then all of my notes <laughs> and criticisms. Yeah. But. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and it's a very honest conversation. And as an editor, I'm always prepared for the author to hate me a little bit. Um, and that's okay. It's it's like when you know you work at a regular job and you're someone's boss and you know that your colleagues are going out for drinks on Friday and just complaining about you. And I'm okay with my authors doing that as long as um, we can have honest and open conversations and make the book the best that it can be. So yeah, it's it's about sensitivity and trusting each other at the end of the day. In terms of that trust, I mean, I remember years and years ago now in various writing groups, and this was long before I worked at the National Centre for Writing, actually, but I've encountered other writers who would kind of have the attitude that they didn't need an editor because they knew oh, their work the best. Of course. You know, like, <laughs> like they didn't want someone else coming in who wouldn't understand what they were trying to do or, you know, they couldn't possibly understand their material in the way that they did because they were the closest to it and this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I just wondered, like, anyone who's maybe right at the start of the process and isn't quite sure, like, why they would need an editor, what would you say to people who are in that position at the moment? Oh, I would say that everybody needs an editor. Even editors need editors. I mean, that's <laughs> why that's why a book will pass through so many hands before it gets to the finished stage. I mean, the most obvious um, reason for that is you've been sitting with your book for so long and you kind of have your blinkers on. Uh, but there's just certain things that you don't see or notice about a text. So having fresh eyes is very important to point out not simply obvious mistakes, but to maybe say, this doesn't feel right. Um, and of course, you can have you know a friend or a family read 
member read your book and point these things out. But the thing about an editor is that they'll be able to point out what doesn't feel right and will be able to articulate why and how you can fix it. And what good editors do is they really ask you the right questions about where you want to go with your book that will really make you think about everything in a whole new light. Um, one example is I um, did a an example edit of somebody's first romance novel, and this person had never written before, and they had had this book inside of them for years, and they had, it had just flowed out of them, and it had a wonderful rhythm to it, um, but there were certain conventions of writing that they just didn't know about. And so I went through and I did a line edit. I left comments with suggestions. I left comments with questions about um, how she wanted the reader to feel at certain points, what she wanted characters to experience. Um, and she came back to me a week later saying that my comments had changed her whole perspective of the book and she was going to rewrite it completely. <laughs> <laughs> because it had just, it had broadened her own perception of what her book could be. So rather than thinking of editors as people who will correct and, and attack your book, editors are people who will help you enrich your book. And everybody needs that outside perspective. An editor will help you find the best version of your book. They're not trying to change it into some other person's book. Exactly. Yeah. We we don't come in just to antagonize you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's partly because a lot of people's only real encounter with having, you know, creative work critiqued, I suppose, will, will have been from when they were at school. And yes. the context at school is so often you know, corrections. It's like, you know, this is wrong. You spelled this wrong. This is not quite right. Yeah. Certainly when I was growing up, I, I think education's maybe improved slightly since then. But you know, I think maybe that puts you in a, an overly defensive uh, mode when it comes to doing things like writing. Oh, so that when oh you, for sure. Yeah. When you're then dealing with an editor who's actually got a very different approach to any, you know, an English teacher, um, <laughs> it's, it's a different thing, but maybe people have to kind of get past some of those lingering fears at first. Well, I mean, what I always tell people is that for the purposes of writing a book, spelling and grammar don't matter very much, because you can always hire an editor to to fix all of that for you. Um, mm. Bad spelling and grammar doesn't detract from the heart of the book and the rhythm and flow of sentences. In fact, a lot of the times when I edit... I purposely don't follow grammatical rules because a sentence just sounds better without it. Um, and I feel like that does kind of make people feel better about showing me their work <laughs> because um, all of these things can can easily be fixed. But what makes the novel unique is that it came from it came from them. Yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of dealing with you know, some of that feedback, and then you giving feedback to writers, you, you you said earlier that it's best to do it, you know, over the phone or in person um, whenever possible. And I was just wondering how the pandemic and everyone being stuck at home and you know making face to face meetings harder, how that's kind of, if at all, affected how you work with your clients. Oh, it's definitely affected it. Um, I think most recently for the for the novel that we're currently um, producing for our publishing house, Kurumuru Books, um, we're at the copy edit and proofing stage. So a few months ago during, you know, the last lockdown, um, we were Skyping with our author who is currently in Italy. So keeping in mind, you know, everybody's time constraints and everybody's fraught anxious feelings in the pandemic, it's hard to schedule a phone call where all you're going to discuss is aspects of the book that need changing. So in order to kind of make the relationship flow more smoothly, you know, we keep in touch regularly via, via other ways. Um, and we set out exactly how and when we'll communicate so we don't constantly intrude on the author's life. Um, so for about a week of the copy edit stage, um, our author was okay with us constantly texting her with line queries. And a lot of those were easy to deal with via WhatsApp, but anything that was more complicated, we would just pick up the phone and call her and, and talk it through. Yeah, I guess the last thing you want is 
you know, I, I kind of the, the, the emotionless way an email can come across sometimes. And, yes, you know, yeah. If, got, if you have feedback and criticisms in that, and you know, the the, the writer gets it and then you know stews on it for ages. Whereas yeah. actually, if you have that proper conversation, it, it, it's if it can feel less intense in some ways. It can feel less intense. Yes, I mean, we also always provide um, a bullet point list of the main kind of changes and queries that we have. So in this case, um, Amarantha, the book that we're working on at the moment, it's a Mediterranean fantasy epic for young adults. It's over 300 pages. So um, this is maybe round five of the editing stage. So we've already made a lot of changes. And the document with these final queries was about 15 pages of things that we ask the author to go through and change. So having it all laid out in the document with each page number, with each line mentioned, just made it so much easier for the author to go through and quickly say, yes, no, this is what I meant. I agree with you here. I'm going to argue with you on this. So we can we can make the process much more streamlined that way. Yeah, uh, it made me think, because uh, it's something that I think we all encounter in personal lives or and in work lives, mm -hmm. just in terms of versioning, like the nuts yes. and bolts of how you don't get in a massive muddle about which version everyone's working from. Like oh, God, what yeah. techniques do you do to, to avoid that kind of thing? Oh, I mean, inevitably, um, people end up putting edits into the wrong document or <laughs> old versions get printed out. Um, a long time ago, when I first started working with the author, Lucinda Riley, um, at the time, you know, she had already written 10 books when I joined her as editor, but um, she didn't have a cloud on her computer. So um, for the most recent novel she'd written, a lot of the manuscripts had just disappeared whenever the computer crashed. <laughs> and it wasn't until I suggested that we maybe use a mm. file sharing site like Dropbox, um, where we could preserve each version of the manuscript and timestamp it and use track changes in Microsoft Word, which was revolutionary to old school authors at the time, <laughs> um, that we kind of got on board with making sure we knew which version everybody was looking at. Because it's when it's just you working on something, it's easy enough to get in a muddle. But when you're emailing files back and forth between different editors, you end up losing so much time if somebody's been working from a file from a month ago we've all encountered that in various contexts haven't we oh yeah do you know i've cri <laughs> i've cried over things like that <laughs> yeah 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 you spend ages working on something and then you realize hang on a second i'm sure i've already written this bit <laughs> yeah in terms of self-editing so you know writers editing their own work mm -hmm. um how much of that should a writer uh, this is probably not a question you can answer definitively but like at what point should a writer get in touch with an editor you know how much editing themselves should they do um before they you know hire an editor or start seeking to work with an editor it's really up to them it's really at the point where they feel they've hit a wall with the book they're working on and they start to hate it <laughs> i think every every writer will recognize that point in a book where they just hate every single character and they wish they'd never started on this journey once they get to that point they probably should have hired an editor maybe like a week ago <laughs> to help them <laughs> out um you can definitely self-edit um i think the issue is when you're writing writing a book is such a difficult endeavor to start with I always recommend that authors don't edit themselves as they're writing the first draft. I think that's that's a pitfall that many people stumble on um, when writing their first book. You know, they they write one page and then they obsessively rewrite a paragraph and they spend a month doing that and then they don't get any further. Uh, the first draft of the book is the most organic. It should just come out of you. Don't look back at anything you've written before because it's going to be a hot mess and you're not <laughs> going to like it and you're going to hate yourself. Just get the whole manuscript out and then take a break from it and then look at it again after you've had some breathing space to really reevaluate everything. And that's the best time to self-edit. And you might find that 
you know, your first manuscript was great, you're a genius, or you find that you want to rewrite everything. And that's okay. That's a part of the process. Yeah, I mean, I find that, you know, the, just the act of writing, I tend to find makes me a better writer as I go Definitely. along. Definitely, yeah. So, yeah, you can get into this infinite loop if you're not careful because, you know, you write three chapters. If you then look back at them, you'll be like, oh, I've got better ideas now. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, know, you can repeat that process infinitely and never get to the end of a project. Yeah. I think it really depends on on how you approach projects in life in general. If you're the kind of person who's very pernickety and a perfectionist and who has to finish each step before moving on to the next, um, it makes the process of writing a book more laborious. For example, an author I'm working with is is writing a, um, a heist fantasy novel, uh, which is involving quite a lot of Ocean's Eleven type plotting. Um, and so he keeps getting stuck on the big heists because he needs to sit down and actually figure out how to rob this bank himself, for example. <laughs> yeah. um, and and I keep saying to him, it's okay that you're stuck on this, but it's also okay to skip past that completely and just continue writing the book. Because as you write the book, you'll you'll just get to know your characters better and you'll also discover new solutions to the problems you encountered before. And that's exactly what happened. As he continued writing the book and developing the characters, the the idea for the heist kind of just fell into place. And then he was able to go back and fill in what he'd skipped over before. Yeah, it's that, it's that kind of paradox that even if you spend all the time in the world trying to plan and prepare your book, you'll still end up having some of your best ideas while you're writing it. So exactly. you might as well just get on with it. <laughs> yeah. Or in the shower or on the toilet. I mean, the bathroom is a very, a very creative space. <laughs> and this is another thing I absolutely recommend for all writers to um, make notes or just make little um, voice notes for themselves on their phone when they have a thought. A surprising amount of authors don't write down their ideas, which is ironic, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm always fearful of those ideas you have, like just as you're dropping off to sleep. Yes. And you think, oh, I'll, I'll write that down in the morning. And then you wake up in the morning and you can't remember it. You can remember that you had an idea, yeah. but you don't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny how that the human brain, you mentioned like you know, being in the bathroom, and it's kind of because you can't really do anything else at that point. So it feels like your brain then has the space to go off and start ticking over some of those ideas. Exactly. And I think maybe these days we you know, we fill all of our spaces, don't we, with social media and YouTube videos and like, we don't give ourselves that kind of downtime space, which is so critical to creative thinking. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I also think that um, in terms of using your downtime effectively, um, reading is the best thing to do. Sometimes when you're reading other people's books, um, an idea will pop into your head because you're just so inspired by by their words. Um, reading is what really trains good writers and editors, and you can get that at the library for free. In terms of those difficult conversations that we've talked about a bit, if a writer is working with an editor and fundamentally disagrees with them about something, which I'm sure happens. All the time. <laughs> Like what's 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 the way to deal with that? I suppose like how can that be turned into something useful and productive? It's a question of picking your battles, and it's also a question of putting your ego aside. Um, I mean, a lot of people call editors know-it-alls, and to an extent, we are not just because we have to know know so much in order to edit effectively. I mean, the other day when I was editing, um, we were looking up how church organs work effectively. Um, it's random stuff like that. But also you have to be able to back up your convictions and, and have rationales for the choices that you make. Um, in some cases, if you feel very strongly about making a change as an editor, you have to be prepared to argue about it and to really convince an author to make that change. Um, but that's only if you have an actually good reason for it, if it will benefit the book in the end. If the only reason is that you think personally it would be better, that's not enough. That's more out of vanity or ego or wanting to be right. And that doesn't help anyone at the end of the day. 
Um, so with a lot of things, um, with a lot of edits that I give authors, when an author pushes back on something, I really have to ask myself, did I make that change because I think it's better? Or did I make that change because it would make the book better? And that's the starting point for discussions with an author. And if the author flat out says, no, I won't do that. Um, I won't compromise on any of this. It's my art. That's okay. At the end of the day, it's their book. And as the editor, that's the number one rule that you always have to keep in mind. So beyond your, your editing work, you also translate yes. as well. And you know, how, how much does that, what's the kind of split in terms of your editing and translation work? Um, it's about 20% translation. It really varies depending on when I have big projects on the go. Um, a lot of my time is spent editing other people's translations, which is very interesting because um, you kind of notice where the the original language has crept in to the English. And there's just a feeling that something isn't quite right. And so as an editor of translations, what you're trying to do is localize the trans the translated text um, and make it sound as unforeign as possible to an English ear. Um, I mean, there's a whole other debate in translation studies whether or not that feeling of foreignness should be erased in translated texts. Um, and that really depends on genre as well. In the case of the young adult and children's fiction that we're working on in translation, um, we want to keep a balance of you know, having the influences of that other culture and that other language present in the book, but also making it a smooth and uncluttered reading experience for a child. So this, this book that we're working on, Amarantha, is translated from the Italian. So there are a few words left in the English edition that are obviously Italian, but we've decided to leave them um, and to not italicize them. So they simply become a part of that world. Because readers, I feel like a lot of publishers underestimate readers. Readers are really smart. And mm -hmm. if there's an unfamiliar word, they'll either gloss over it and just absorb it, or they'll look it up. There's no need yeah. to be afraid of foreign words anymore. No. And younger readers in particular. I think it's very easy for exactly. uh, you know, adult writers to completely underestimate how clever young people are. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, even, even very young people, yes. uh, you know, in, in you know, under 10s or early teens, you know, they can handle pretty much anything you throw at them, I think. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I think when, when you grow up, you forget the stuff that you used to read when you were, when you were 9 or 10 years old. Um, it was a lot of very complex books. So that's the fun part of editing children's and young adult novels. It's really kind of delving into a world where anything is possible and where they're not restricted by by grown up expectations. Yeah, no, I, I find because I've got an eight year old and you know the books that we read together and that he checks out. Um, you know, there's such a rich just treasure trove of literature for, yes. for younger readers you know i find it sometimes i find it unfortunate that it gets you know categorized as for young readers exactly some, some of it is, is so good and has so much potential for any reader <laughs> really. yeah in terms of kurumuru books which you founded in 2019 yes is that right? yeah what was the what was the intention there what was what was the kind of motivation for starting that there were a few different motivations. Um, essentially, um, one of my best friends, Leah Tanaka, who's also a translator, she turned to me one day and said, let's start a publishing house. And I said, okay. <laughs> and it kind of spiraled from there. I think as translators and editors, we were both quite frustrated with um, publishing in the UK in general. Um, one thing is that obviously publishing is very concentrated on London. So anybody who doesn't live or work there, or can't afford to live and work there, doesn't have an easy access to the publishing industry to get their start, um, especially not writers and artists of color. Um, and Leah and I are both from mixed race backgrounds, both from bilingual backgrounds. 
And one thing that we were really passionate about was diversity in fiction. Um, and we thought rather than complaining about it over wine, we would fix it. <laughs> Easier said than done, especially um, starting a business at the cusp of a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we decided to do translation because, I mean, in the UK, I think it's about 4% of all books published are in translation. And in children's literature, that goes down to 2 or 3%. So children here really aren't exposed to books from other cultures. I mean, they may be written in English um, about other cultures, but that doesn't give you the same insight and empathy that a book by a foreign language author will give you. So obviously, publishing a book in translation is a lot more challenging than publishing a regular book, just because of the added costs. You have to find a way of funding the translation, you have to go through that whole work process, which is um, why, you know, we started in 2019. Our first project isn't coming out until this October. Um, and it's also because my partner and I are doing everything, just the two of us, from initial commissioning, we do contracts, we do every single stage of editing, we do the typesetting ourselves, commissioning book covers, um, negotiating with bookshops, negotiating with the printers, and then marketing and website design. We do it all ourselves. Um and that wasn't just because we have no money. <laughs> <laughs> that was also because there wasn't any other way for us to gain that experience. So everything that we're doing, we're teaching ourselves and we're learning how to do it on the go. And it's been the most difficult, but also the most rewarding process. And yeah. you don't get that experience working as an editorial assistant at Penguin Random House. Um, they won't let you do it. <laughs> they just want you to go get coffee. Um, so this has been just a wonderful journey of seeing a book from beginning to end. Yeah, and you're nearly there as well. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's it's at this point where everybody starts starts crying. It's a very emotional process. And it's it's when you're this close to the end that you kind of feel like it will never happen. Um, I was discussing this with, with our author, Elena Traina the other day, because obviously, for us, the journey with her book started in 2019. Her journey with the book began 10 years ago. From when she first wrote it um, during NaNoWriMo, um, um, yeah. and then worked on the draft, she also composed a musical score to go with it. Um, and then she had it published in Italy. Um, and then the translation pro process with us, it's it's been over a decade for her seeing this book come out in English. And, you know, a few months now ahead of publication is kind of when everything starts to crack and feel very stressful. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, I mean, I guess at least the, you know, the long production time means that the book will be coming out in a relatively easier period of the pandemic That's from a true. book publishing perspective. That's true. Yes. Um, we've had to adapt a lot of our plans um, because, as I mentioned, the book does come with a musical soundtrack and our mm. initial ideas were to have um, to have book readings with a live band to perform that music because each song is fits in perfectly with a movement, a high note of the book. Um, so that's probably something that we'll do in the future. But for this launch, we'll be doing everything online to stay as safe as possible and to still reach as many people as possible. I mean, that's been the great thing about the pandemic is that more people are reading, more people are talking about books because um, no matter what your geographical location is, what your geographic barriers are, people are now getting access to the wonderful world of books. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love the idea of a reading with a live musical accompaniment that's created for that reading as well. It is It is wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the best way to read the book is just to have the soundtrack on in the background. The book mm -hmm. also has a whole language that's been developed for it, not unlike um, Elvish, for example, in The Lord of the Rings. 
Um, so yeah, I understand how how emotional it all is for the author, and it's emotional for me too. But one thing that I remind authors of is that, um, as cruel as it sounds, it doesn't get any easier. You know, having worked with a first time author to having worked with an author who sold 15 million books around the world. This was Lucinda Riley, and she had written 20 books. Lucinda and I worked on 11 bestsellers together. Um, it was just as difficult for her as it was for a debut author. With, with each manuscript, we would come near the end of the process, and there would still be that feeling of, of fear and anxiety that nobody would like it. It would never get finished. It's never going to work. And inevitably, it always did. So yeah. I know that's quite depressing, but I hope <laughs> I hope that gives people a little bit of, of comfort that it's okay that things are difficult. They'll turn out well in the end anyway. Yeah, it's those kind of projects where it, it feels impossible. But as long as no one tells you it's impossible, you end up doing it anyway. And Absolutely. And it's suddenly doable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just you have to eat the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, in terms of diversity in in fiction and children's fiction in particular, I mean, this is a an entirely other podcast conversation oh, that yeah. we could have. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, even asking the question is like, how do you even answer this? But why do you think in children's literature that that you know that percentage of of translated work is so low? It's a combination of factors. The main thing is the cost of it, and from the perspective of a translator and writer, you think, oh, you know, it's it's not that much more. But from the perspective of a publisher now, it is daunting. It is, you know, it it triples, it quintuples your production costs. Um, and when the margins are already so tight in book production, when it's already so difficult to sell books in an oversaturated marketplace, you you have to make some very tough decisions about what you can afford to publish. Um, so a lot of publishers who produce books and translation rely on funding from the Arts Council, from PEN, from individual countries, for example. So if you're publishing a book from the Finnish language, for example, the Finnish Arts Council will um, help you with production costs, for example but it doesn't really touch the sides, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, so publishing in translation is in a lot of ways a passion project. It's never really going to make you money. So that's the first issue. Um, the other issue is the absolute dominance of the English language globally, and also people's reticence to to explore other languages and also not quite fear of other languages or distrust of other languages, but people who aren't used to reading or writing or seeing things in other languages um, will feel uncomfortable with translated works. And I think that's something that can be addressed at a young age, which is why we want to bring out translated works of young adult and children's fiction. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something that translators have been have been working on for, for decades, and we're still trying to <laughs> <Yeah>. fix it. <laughs> yeah, I think what you're saying about, you know, if you get in there from a young age uh, with, with readers or young kids generally encountering work from other parts of the world, uh, even in movies, for example, you know, my son's eight, He's, his reading is now good enough that he can read subtitles, for example. So oh, I've started yeah. trying out you know, foreign movies that are subtitled. And you know, that's an interesting experiment. But I don't think I saw a subtitled movie until I was in my late teens, probably. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the earlier you can introduce some of this stuff, it, it then becomes just expected, doesn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But I guess you're then talking about like a, a generational shift. It's not something that can be fixed in a year. <laughs> exactly. And it's it's very interesting to me because I grew up 
partly in Germany and partly in Thailand. So I was constantly around other languages. And in Germany and Thailand, most of the fiction for sale is in translation. It's translated from English or translated from other from other languages around Europe, for example. Um, I was recently um, working on republishing out-of-print historical fiction by the author Eleanor Fairburn. Um, and she writes a lot of um, court historical fiction. And it was just so wonderful to see, you know, King Henry VIII or Queen Elizabeth or the pirate queen Grania O'Malley code switching between all of these different languages, um, speaking Spanish, Latin, English, French, Irish. And that was just the norm. Everybody was trilingual at the time. and. It's it's a bit sad that in this globalized world now, a lot of people in this country are monolingual and are missing out on this wealth of other languages. Because another language doesn't simply allow you to communicate, it also allows you to think in a different way. And that's why literature and translation presents such unique perspectives that don't exist in original English fiction, for example. I think... You know, as as a parent, comparing what my son has access to in whether it's, it's literature or TV or what have you, in some ways it feels so much more advanced and diverse than it was when I was growing up in the eighties. Yeah, like, it's a completely different world, and and then you have the the, you know, the sobering fact that there's still so much work to be done. There is, but it's it's exciting as well as daunting. <laughs> I try to look at it that way when I feel overwhelmed with the world. Um, it's wonderful that, you know, so many people in the industry are starting to have these very open conversations about diversity. And I think a lot of publishers are frightened by it because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Um, and I think people, I mean, to use a phrase that is floating around. People have to be uncomfortable. People have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I hope that with the way that the pandemic has changed um, the publishing industry, allowing people to work remotely. So not just having it focused so much on London, I'm hoping it will create an influx of creative people of color who will be able to give that different perspective, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, people from different cultures as well. And I think the publishing in industry is on the cusp of this and is improving. I'm going to be positive about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, that will then filter through into the books that then get produced at the other end. That's it. That's it. A yeah. lot of people call editors and publishers the the merchants of culture because they're the ones that they're the tastemakers. They choose what gets published and how it's disseminated. And it really has to start from there. It needs some fresh blood. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got the first book coming out in October. Yes. From Kurumu. What, uh, what's next? What's, what's the plan after that? Um, for Kurumu Books, um, the next plan is to possibly publish from Asian languages in translation. That was always our ultimate goal. I mean, both of us are from, from Asian backgrounds, and there are very few um, books translated from the Thai language, for example. So once this pandemic allows me to travel again, I would love to go back home to Thailand and find works of Thai fiction for children to bring to the UK market. With my own personal editing work, I'm really excited for um, this memoir that I'm helping someone craft. Um, and also, just to keep busy, I've been editing um, the most random books. <laughs> Anytime I, I want to learn something new, be it about software or gardening or cooking, you know, I find, I find another book to edit. And while I'm editing that, I get to learn loads of new things. Excellent. Well, I think Hopefully everyone listening to this will have learned some new things as well. So thank you so much uh, for sharing all that insight. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening and many thanks to Ella for coming on the podcast. If you have questions or want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Writer Centre, on our Facebook page and at our website, 
which is nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. You can sign up to our newsletter there, join our Discord community, and of course, find all of our free resources. As a UK-registered charity, we do rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website by heading to the Support Us page. If you do that, then let me say thank you very much. Please do also review, rate and subscribe or follow the podcast because it helps other people to discover it as well. Thank you again. Keep writing and I'll catch you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.